in the last lecture, we saw how the Second Republic was subverted by Louis Napoleon, who made himself the Emperor of France in 1852 and inaugurated what is known in French history as the Second Empire. The Second Empire we also saw in the last lecture represented a paradox. While it was authoritarian in the beginning, after 1860, it inaugurated what is known as the Liberal Empire. As a result, in spite of authoritarianism, parliamentary institutions and privileges did grow in the 1860s at least. It meant that even opposition was growing. The regime had some degree of success in social and administrative reorganization and indeed succeeded in revitalizing the economy of France, ushering in virtually the industrial revolution in France belatedly but surely. In the sphere of administrative reorganization, what was noteworthy was the development of the urban areas. The city of Paris, the capital, and the center of many an insurrection since 1789 had been reorganized. The task was entrusted to Baron Georges Eugene Haussmann, who was brought by Napoleon III to Paris in 1852 and made the prefect of the Seine. Baron Haussmann undertook a massive program of demolition and reconstruction of Paris. In the process, a new Paris emerged. The Paris of tree-lined and broad boulevards, of squares and sparks. But while Paris of Second Empire had become grand and beautiful, it did not mean that the seamier side of Paris had disappeared altogether. The poorer sections in the living in the city had now been pushed towards the suburbs and continued to live in insanitary and unhygienic condition. What is significant to note about this is the political implication of this. As we did mention earlier, Paris had been the center of many an insurrection since 1789. And we had also seen in our earlier lectures on the French Revolution and on the revolutions of 1830 and 48, that a typical form that the insurrections took in Paris was the setting up of barricades. The narrow lanes could be barricaded and thereby impede the movement of the troops sent to quell them. Now, the broad boulevards uh, removed the possibility of such barricades and it also facilitated the way in which the troops could be moved to quell political disturbances and insurrections. Political order and stability had been one of the basic aims of this new regime and uh, it was felt that this is also the most important need of the people. Napoleon wanted to fulfill this need. At the same time, it was his desire to heal the wounds and, and bring about a reconciliation. Napoleon III's economic ideas were very rudimentary. He wanted through public works to, to develop uh, the economy by a massive spending. This would help the peasants in the countryside as also it was expected, the worker in the urban areas. He wanted the majority of Frenchmen to be content. The regime did witness a steady expansion of the economy and the role of the state in this was very crucial. Louis Napoleon, uh, we had seen earlier, uh, propagated very extremely vague socialist ideas and he probably shared some of sent Simon's uh, uh, belief that uh, economic progress would bring about improvement in the condition of the poorer sections of the uh, society. 
we had earlier seen that in the extinction of poverty, he had propagated these very uh, general and rather vague views. What one notices is a change in the policy of credit. Uh, it was known as the policy of productive expenses. The government would spend huge sums of money on public projects and the deficit in the budget would be met by credit. And for this one needed new institutions that would provide this uh, credit. To the orthodox, this kind of a financial policy always implied the possibility of a bankruptcy. But financial innovation was something that the regime did witness. If we may give a few figures, in 1853, uh, the consolidated public debt in millions of francs had been 5,577. In 1865, it rose to a peak of 13,026 millions, whereas in 1869, it was still 11,506. There was floating debt as well. There was a increased confidence in business circles and a massive amount of money was being spent in public works. The government also provided a stimulus to private enterprise by uh, initiating these, by, through these large scale public works and granting concessions to the vast railway network. In short, as Bouvier has said, the strong state uh, became the welfare state of large-scale capitalism. There was a favorable economic cycle which in the opinion of Ernest Labrousse uh, was due to the discovery of gold in California and later in Australia. As a result, an increase in prices and it also uh, led to a, a, a surge in entrepreneurial profit. Money supply soiled very rapidly and I am quoting again the figures uh, from around 3,900 million francs in 1845, it rose to about 8,600 million francs in 1870. The inflow of gold also changed the pattern of coinage and there was more of gold coins available now. Prices rose steadily during the Second Empire and this was reflected in the rise of national income as well. Historians are not unanimous in saying that uh, genuine industrial revolution came to France during the Second Empire. But there is a, a general consensus that if one really looks at the point of transition in the history of French industrialization, it is this period that one has to look for. There was, as we have noted earlier, some kind of a steady economic progress during this period. Particularly in the 1860s, there had been a fairly steady progress. The three decades following 1845-54 saw the change of the original textile vanguard and the core sector, iron and steel, uh, etc. By the late 1860s, again, 40 percent of France's iron and steel requirements were met by two very large installations, very large and modern installations. Thus, the huge factories, uh, properly speaking, arrived in France in course of this uh, mutation which was gradually taking place. There was also a growth in these industries. The production of iron increased by 3 percent steadily, that of steel by 10 percent and non-ferrous metals by as much as 20 percent. Only industry did not change during this period. There had to be change in agriculture as well. There had been finally some innovations in, in agriculture, mechanical reapers, better input of fertilizer, better drainage facilities and a, an, an initiative that the peasants finally showed meant that agricultural production was gradually increasing. Whereas uh, up in the first half of the 19th century, it grew by 1 percent uh, in the decades 
after uh, Napoleon III, uh, including the period of Second Empire, the increase registered around uh, a growth of uh, 1.8 percent. So, in this way, it had been changing. Underlying both the rural and the manufacturing sector was a tremendous spurt in railway production. Construction of a railway line uh, had started in the 1830s, but now after uh, 1850s, there had been a great increase in the amount of money spent on this and uh, the expansion of the railway network. Uh, compared to the period from uh, 1855 to 64, in the next three decades, railway construction increased by a, a staggering 700 percent. Whereas, uh, between 1835 and 1844, only 34 million francs had been invested in railway construction. In 1845-54 decade, it rose to 175 million francs and in the next decade to 487 million francs. Now, this expansion of railways also produced a voracious appetite for iron and steel, for coal and therefore, it had a spin-off effect on the expansion of this core sector in the industrialization. Another area where there had been very significant change was in the uh, process of organizing credit in banking. New institutions were coming up. Uh, one such institution was Credit Foncier, which was a nationwide central mortgage bank, uh, supplied an official subsidy of 10 million francs into the important work of building uh, cities and, and other uh, uh, related public works. So, you have the money that was required for the public works, the, the, the vast amount of money now organized by the new institutions which uh, could bring or provide the capital required for that. Agriculture was not neglected either. Institutions like Credit Agricole or Quantua d'Agriculture had in, in, in indeed met the demand for capital in the countryside and it was linked directly to the agricultural innovations that we had talked of earlier. But the most significant innovation was the Credit Mobilier. This was the uh, first joint stock company to practice what is known as mixed banking, which invested capital as long-term loan to businessmen. Indeed, comm commencing business in the 1850s, this soon became the European paradigm for growth conscious bank with large investment stock. In 1860 came the Anglo-French Commercial Treaty. It, it opened the French businessmen and entrepreneurs to competition. Uh, the policy, older policy of uh, uh, protectionism with which the French governments persisted for a long time was now removed. And it, 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 it did provide for competition and growth. Overall, as Francois Cruzet has said, uh, this period witnessed the joint structural mutation of the French economy. Economic expansion was accompanied by the building of colossal fortunes. As Emile Zola in an article in uh, Le Rappel in May 1870 said that, I'm quoting him, quote, Balzac's richest heroes would today be fairly modest gentlemen, unquote. Industrial growth, however, was not homogeneous. Uh, this was indeed a basic weakness of French industrialization. On the whole, however, in spite of the fact that the traditional uh, uh, organization continued, uh, on the whole, as uh, again one historian has put it, the world of Balzac was being so slowly transformed into the world of Emile Zola. Balzac's novels depicted uh, what France was like in the first half of the 19th century, whereas Zola's novels depicted what France was to be in the second half of the 19th century. This second empire was in a kind of a tension between the two periods. Let us briefly look at the foreign policy before we see how the regime came to an end. <music> Napoleon's foreign policy was in a way uh, a, a burden of, of heritage because he had to 
always live in the shadow of the exploits of Napoleon uh, the first. Here again was characterized by a degree of half-heartedness and he always did not push his policy to their to its logical conclusion. He started the, the regime fairly well by intervening in the uh, Crimean War to save the Ottoman Empire from the uh, from being crushed by the Russians. Uh, he was joined in this by uh, Britain as well. Uh, the Anglo-French combined came out victorious and again France's centrality was underlined by the fact that France did become the center of, uh, of European politics as the Peace Congress after the Crimean War did take place in Paris. So the incident relating to the so-called Eastern question had resulted in some comfort for France. In the 1850s another major uh, uh, event was the relationship between Napoleon III and the quest for Italian unification. Napoleon had always wanted to do something for France. Cavour had indeed joined the uh, Peace of Paris to, to internationalize this Eastern question, the Italian question and, and expected French uh, assistance in, the, in, in their quest for unity. But Napoleon did nothing, though he said he would do something. There was this Orsini plot Orsini who tried to assassinate the uh, emperor unsuccessfully but then in from his prison he exhorted the emperor to do something. Napoleon as it were was awakened to the need to do something for Italy and he met Cavour at Plombier in the Vos and uh, concluded a pact. Uh, France would support uh, Italy against Austria if Austria attacked Piedmont uh, unprovoked and then Napoleon would support extension of Piedmont into a kingdom of northern Italy. The central Italian duchies could be organized into a central Italian kingdom, the papal states, the Naples would be independent and a federation might be organized. And, and for this, France will take Savoy and Nice to make her frontier in the southeast a scientific one. Indeed, France helped uh, Piedmont uh, when Austria uh, attacked. There was a victory of the battle in the battles of Magenta and Solferino, but then Napoleon performed a Waldfass and concluded the Peace of Villafranca with uh, Austria. By this agreement, Piedmont took Lombardy, but Venetia remained with Austria, and uh, Napoleon did not take Savoy and Nice. But there was a huge cry of betrayal by Napoleon as far as the Italians were concerned. But then events went beyond him. The, there was a revolt in the central Italian duchies, they wanted to join Piedmont and ultimately Napoleon accepted the unity which was brought about by Cavour and Garibaldi and the Kingdom of Italy emerged in 1861. Napoleon uh, accepted the, this but he also received Savoy and Nice uh, which he insisted was France's due share by now in terms of the old agreement. Now, he did support Italy, but because of his prevarication and because of his, uh, what was perceived as his territorial greed in taking Savoy and Nice, he did not win the full gratitude of the Italian people. He continued to support the Italian cause later as well and uh, indeed received Venetia from Austria after the Austro-Prussian War and handed it over to Italy. But here again, there was a half-heartedness which was uh, not quite congenial to his reputation or to uh, France's uh, benefit. At the end of the uh, 60s, Ferdinand de Lesseps excavated the Suez Canal and that had uh, the blessing of the French king. When he started a, an expedition in the Mexico, that ended in a disaster. Uh, England, France and Spain together had started a debt collecting expedition in Spain in, the, in Mexico in the early 1860s. But later Napoleon thought of establishing a Latin Catholic empire there. And this Latin Catholic empire was not to be and he wanted to maintain the Habsburg Archduke Maximilian as the emperor of this Mexican empire. The US government after recovering from the civil war was against it because it was a gross violation of the uh, Monroe Doctrine which shut Europeans out from America and 
uh, ultimately it resulted in a disaster. Napoleon was obliged to withdraw. The Mexican uh, debacle came just before his final involvement with Prussia and the so-called Franco-Prussian War. Napoleon wanted to give it out in the early 60s that he would leave Austria and Prussia a free hand in Germany if they wanted his, his support. He was very cleverly played into the hands of Bismarck in course of the 1860s. After Bismarck had managed to win Schleswig-Holstein along with Austria, he met uh, uh, Bismarck at Biarritz. Now, in spite of uh, this agreement with Bismarck, he also gave a free hand apparently to Austria later. And when, in spite of this, the Austro-Prussian War ended in a quick Prussian victory in the uh, war Battle of Sadwa or Koregratz, he ultimately moved in to demand Venetia, which he of course handed over to uh, Italy. Later, he wanted some compensation for France. He felt that it was also France's victory. He demanded uh, Belgium or Luxembourg or part of this territory as compensation for France. Bismarck encouraged him to uh, give this in writing to publicize later and indicate his uh, avarice, his, his greed and his annexationist attitude. Finally, the war came in 1870. Uh, it came over the issue of the Hohenzollern candidature uh, for the throne of Spain. When a, a prince of the Prussian ruling dynasty was set up as the candidate for the throne of Spain, Napoleon objected. Uh, and Leopold, the candidate, withdrew his candidature. Napoleon now wanted to cater to French public opinion and asked his ambassador Benedetti to meet the emperor and uh, at a place called Ems and uh, demand that the candidature would not be renewed in future. This the emperor refused to give and he told Benedetti that as far as he is concerned, the affair was closed. He then indicated all this uh, to Bismarck in a telegram known as the famous Ems telegram. Bismarck cleverly uh, tutored the text to indicate that Benedetti had indeed been insulted by uh, the emperor. Public opinion in France reached fever pitch. There was a great deal of jingoism. Napoleon succumbed and thus Bismarck very successfully provoked a war and the war ended in the disastrous Battle of Sedan in which Napoleon uh, was badly defeated and that is uh, the end of the empire. This came on 2nd of September 1870, uh, the Prussian forces came in, etc. Let us briefly return to the internal politics and see what was happening in the 1860s. The liberal empire was kind of inaugurated in 1860. We had seen in the last lecture that uh, the legislative body was uh, given power to discuss the, uh, the speech from the throne, to discuss the budget. The ministers were asked to respond to questions from the members. The press could uh, freely report the debates in the assembly, etc. In this way, the liberalization uh, at least uh, should have increased the uh, acceptability of the regime, but it did not. The Catholics were very anxious about the threat to the Pope's existence and they were critical of uh, the Emperor's policy with regard to Italy and uh, to an extent Germany. The growing opposition demonstrated that the regime had failed to achieve uh, reconciliation. Uh, he want, could have cultivated the conservatives, but the conservatives were not happy because of the concession given by him the liberal concessions also allowed the radical opposition to, to grow. There was the, the working classes. They were also given some uh, freedom now. They could organize trades council and unions. He introduced uh, the process of reconciliation councils, which uh, comprised government representatives, representatives of the uh, employer and the uh, workers. They addressed the 
uh, problems that the working class faced and suggested uh, a reform. Uh, wages were improved uh, sometimes, but then these reconciliation councils also became a very significant fora for labor activism. Uh, and, and that is very important. He also did a very important thing. The provision of the civil court that the employees would have to carry uh, identity card issued by the employer had been scrapped. Now, these were not seen by the conservatives in a good light, but it did encourage the workers to unionize and be militant. We may very quickly look at the pattern of voting. Uh, in year 1852, the vote for government had been 5.2 millions. It reached a peak of 5.4 millions uh, in 1857. But in 1869, it went down to 4.4 millions, whereas the vote for opposition was only 810,000 in 1852. It came down to 665,000 in 1857. In 1863, it was 1.9 millions, but in 1869, it was nearly 3.5 millions. And the vote for government did not decrease much, but the vote for the opposition increased substantially. Why did it happen? Because of the decrease in abstentions. In 1852, abstention was about 3.6 millions. In 1869, it had come down to 2.2 millions. So it seemed that people were participating in, in politics. This is the result of liberalization. People were participating, there was less abstention and opposition grew in support. The end, however, came not because of the growth of opposition, but because of the military debacle. One does not know what would have happened if liberalism continued and, and the, if the regime continued, it would have become more liberal. But the defeat uh, in the hands of Prussia put paid to the aspirations of the emperor and those who supported him. France once again became a third repub a republic, the third republic which continued till the beginning of the Second World War was set up, a provisional government was set up, but France was in total disarray. The Prussian forces occupied France and even Paris. The new German Empire was formed in the palace of Versailles in January 1871 and the emperor, the Prussian king was anointed the emperor of Germany in the famous uh, uh, Sal de Glas or Hall of Mirrors in the palace of Versailles. And from January to May 1871, Paris witnessed the last of the old style insurrections or as some people would believe, the first of a new socialist kind of insurrection, the rising of the Paris Commune. The rising, however, ended with a brutal repression in May 1871. This is how then the Second Empire met its end and France had ever since remained a republic.